Okay, thank you, Katie. It is a great honor and pleasure for me to have Dr. Safiso Ndlovu on campus and to introduce him to you today. Um, he is uh, one of my favorite people and historians from South Africa, and I don't want to take too much time away from his talk, so I will try to be brief. There are many things that I could say about him, but I want to make two um, points. And one is that he has earned great respect as a historian, and that is um, rightly deserved. Um, so I want to focus first on some of the th great things about his work as a historian and then how he is in a position to uh, influence the history initiatives in South Africa and even more broadly because of his work. Um, he is very thorough and meticulous and I know he has um, applied that same care and energy that he puts in his historical work to preparing his talk today. Um, so we are very uh, lucky and blessed to have him. He has an eclectic publication record with works on sport um, and migrant nurses and also pre-colonial South African history. His focus is on, or has been mostly on, South African liberation movements and their history. He was born and raised in Soweto, South Africa, just outside of Johannesburg, um, one of the most famous, uh, famous cities in, in South Africa. And he has made great contributions to South African history through his work on the Soweto uprisings of 1976, which he also was a participant in. Um, so maybe if you have more questions about that, he can talk about that. Um, his work on the Soweto uprisings includes his first book, Counter Memories of of the uprisings, as well as his work in the Hector Peterson Museum in Soweto. And for me, as a a budding historian when I visited him. We met six years ago at the museum. I was so impressed with all of the different sources that he brought into the museum and the reach of his research. Um, and in the past six years that I've known him, he's taught me much about the work of historians. And um, one thing that I really appreciate about him is the way that he takes students and everyone seriously. Um, even though I'm very much his junior, he's taken the time to teach me and send me numerous resources. He's very generous in that sense. So the second point of how he um, has such an influence on South African history and the positions he has, um, as one of few black South African historians in the post-apartheid period, he has played a major role in a number of history initiatives. And for the past 12 years, he has had a, a great impact and influence um, been intimately involved in the South African Democracy and Education Trust, which was uh, commissioned by President, then President Thabo Mbeki in 2000. And the, the project is working on a multi-volume series called The Road to Democracy, really looking at the history of the South African liberation movements and struggles at, from different angles and different time periods. Um, next year, for example, they have the fifth volume coming out focused on African solidarity. So all of the African countries throughout the continent who had supported the anti-apartheid struggle. And this follows on volume three of the series, which was focused on international solidarity. So in that book, we see how the United States was very much involved, not necessarily the government, but more the people itself in pushing um, its government, the United States government, to um, do things that would help bring down apartheid. Um, along with, so now he is uh, a, a, an executive director of, of this SADAT, of the South African Democracy Education Trust, and he is also a scientific uh, committee member of UNESCO's General History of Africa. So his Influence is not only just in South Africa, but beyond. Uh, and right now they're working on updating the eight volumes of the history of Africa that UNESCO has produced. Despite his soft voice, he can be very bold. And I want to just give you a, a taste of, of what he has done. I, in June, was it, or May, it was June. It was June, we went to a book launch and we I saw him uh, reprimand the chairman of the ruling party, the, chair, the national chairperson of the African National Congress, um, telling her that they needed to change their stance towards history education. So we're very lucky to have him, and I'd like to invite you to join me in welcoming him here today.
Thanks a lot, Giabonga. I'm going to address UNEC Zulu people. So, I mean, um, I've run out of weight in terms of hospitality that I've received here. So we have uh, ECI Zulu proverbs that explain these issues in as far as your humanity and your warmth. Actually, this theme is going to come up in my, in my, in my presentation because this is exactly what um, uh, the former president Mandela said during his first trip here in the U.S. You know, so in Isi Zulu, I can simply say, Isi su somhambi singangenzo enyoni and abage babonani bapinde babonani. So I'm simply saying, you know, the first proverb pro proverb about Isi su somhambi singangenzo enyoni. I'm saying. Uh, any stranger should be welcome to your home and take care of that stranger in need and let him or her to become part of your family. And when during the duration of his day, you know, in pre-colonial times, remember, they didn't have the technological uh, GIS, you know, things. So, so what they used to do when walking for a long distance, if they'll take a stick or wood around, if I'm sleeping under the tree or whatever during the nightfall, I'll, it will face a certain direction so that when I wake up, I know that I shouldn't lose my bearings. I'll continue this way. But you know, human beings are human beings. Some of us are naughty if I come across this person and then I'll change the direction of the stick. <laughs> Then you take uh, the opposite direction, you are lost, and then you come across a homestead, so you are desperate. Then this proverb says, don't dismiss that person. Welcome that person as a stranger. He's, he represents you, you know, as part of humanity. So this is how I felt like. And during the visit also yesterday to Salt Lake City, I really learned a lot. So the second proverb on Bake uh, Babonani, Bapinde Babonani is about we'll meet again in future, uh, either here or in South Africa. I don't know. Because the reason why I'm using the African National Congress as a, st as a case study, it's precisely because it's the oldest liberation movement in the world. It's 100 years old. So you just have to find question you answer the question why is it because other liberation movements imploded you know even when they are in power they they just mess up things you know the ANC seems to they'll be in power for some years as far as I'm concerned so because we're part of the global world and Americans have been in South Africa for a long time it means therefore I see the youngsters here, the f our future leaders. You'll have to understand the African National Congress, its history, because they are the ruling government, regardless of their strengths and their weaknesses. And we'll have to answer the question that they've been there for so many years to come. And they have this love and hate relationship with the Americans, which we'll discuss. <laughs> and, and, and it dates back to the 19th century, if you want to know so then. Then, then, then yeah, I'll explain why and how we did that so so long ago. I also flew here for 18 hours. You know, I spent about 18 hours on the airplane. So I thought that I can't spend 18 hours on the airplane and then spend about 20 to 30 minutes on my presentation. So I have to compensate. You know, so so I'm warning you that the lecture is going to be about an hour. So feel free to leave the room if you have to rush to a lecture or whatever. But you are also welcome to ask questions. It's really about uh, world politics, history, and international relations. And, 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 and in that sense, the paper is probably divided into three parts. The first part is about the relationship between the African National Congress and American people. And also the second part, it's about the 
movement itself. It's about the liberation movement, how it operated, and, 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 and the third part, and, and in terms of how it operated, and in how did they decide to make Nelson Mandela the public face of the organization. The last part is about um, international history and politics, diplomacy, a comparative analysis between Mandela and other political prisoners in Latin America. You know, there is that aspect. You know, and some of you are teaching politics and history. Well, I mean, that's that's an that's a, that's that's an, uh, that's sort of an area that has been under researched, which I think it's it's really important for us to to understand. I'm trying to say that South Africa is not a unique case study. There are other case studies, particularly in the Latin American uh, continent. So. I'll begin by by saying that as all of you are aware that there exists a rich comparative historiographical tradition between the United States of America and South Africa, particularly on race, racism, discrimination, class, equality, justice, black liberation, and white supremacy. This historical tradition is reflected in, publica in publications by Bernard Makoseswe Makubane and George M. Fredrickson, amongst us, others. So there is, there is really literature that covers the relationship between uh, South Africa and the US. And there's a growing list of publications in that regard. But about the title of my talk, it is really about their love and hate relationship that existed between the African National Congress and the American people. On the relevance of the African National Congress to the people of the United States of America, it is important to note that two of the most important founding fathers of the ANC were educated here in the USA. They were educated here. That is um, Pixley Isaka Kaseme and also uh, John Dube. It's more than two members. I'm first mentioning the first two because I'm doing it chronologically, as you'll find out exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the founder of the ANC, Pixley, Isaka Kaseme, really, his education here was beheaded by the American Missionary Board. Pixley Kaseme was educated here. He was born in the late 19th century and grew up at the Inanda Mission Station in KwaZulu Natal, where an American Congregationalist missionary, as Pixley, from whom he took his name was interested in arranging for him to go to Mount Hermon School in Massachusetts, in Massachusetts to, to attend school. He then attended Columbia University, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1906, and with continuing financial support from his missionary benefactors, he continued to study at the University of Oxford, Jesus College. And in 1910, he was admitted to the bar as an advocate, as, as a lawyer. And he was therefore a member of the founding National Executive Committee of the ANC. And from 1913 to 1937, he was the president of the ANC. John Langa Libalele Dube, the first president of the African National Congress was also educated here in the US. He was born in 1871 at the Inanda Mission Station of the American Zulu Mission in KwaZulu Natal, in the area now uh, called KwaZulu Natal. Actually, there's a rich heritage uh, trail in that area of the American Mission Port. If you are in South Africa as an American, 
you should visit that area. The schools and all the missionaries are still intact. And his father was also a pastor at that American mission school. After studying at the Amam Zimtote Training Institute, which later becomes Adam, Adam's College, named after an American missionary, he sought greener pastures elsewhere. In 1877, in 1887, he went to America and attended a preparatory school at Oberlin College in Ohio. He returned to South Africa in 1892 and became a teacher at one of the American board mission schools. Two years later, he resigned to become superintendent of an industrial school. But in 1897, he again returned to America, this time to study theology at a seminary in Brooklyn. After three years study, he was ordained by the Congregationalist Church and returned to KwaZulu-Natal, where he set about to establish Ohlango, Ohlange Institute, a school modeled on the principles of self-help and vocational education as pioneered by Bukati, Washington at Tuskegee. I'm, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing American <laughs> place names cor correctly at Tuskegee, and also the Hampton Institute. Uh, I'm not sure, where is the Hampton Institute? In fact, he, I'm not sure, I couldn't trace it, but it's, it's here in the United States. What happened also, Oslango opened its doors in 1901 after Dube overcame great obstacles. And in 1904, 1905, he returned to the United States of America on the first of three trips to fundraise for his school. I suggest that you read Manning Marable's doctoral thesis on Dube, where he which he attained at the University of Maryland in 1975 to be able to appreciate the relationship between the founders of the ANC and the people of the United States of America. Also, you can read R. Hunt Davis' article titled John Langalibalele Dube, a South African exponent of Bukati, Washington. It is published in the Journal of African Study, Volume 2, 1975. All of you know that uh, Marable, uh, Manning Marable also is the publisher of uh, Malcolm X uh, biography. So before he, he, he took his doctorate on, on, on June 2. Also, a third president of the ANC, that is Alfred Bettini Kuma, was also educated here in the United States of America. He attended school here, post-secondary school here in the US. He came here in 1913 and spent two years at Tuskegee. Is it Tuskegee? <laughs> Tuskegee. <laughs> he spent two years there. And then he enrolled at the College of Agriculture at the University of Minnesota, paying for his education with money he earned while doing manual jobs in colliards, stables, hotels, and trains. Among his friends was Roy Wilkins, who were was to become a major African American, American civil rights leader. Nkwame Nkrumah, whom he first met whilst he was here in the US, was among one of his famous friends. Graduating with a PhD degree from Minnesota in 1920, he then studied for two years at the Marquette University Medical School in Milwaukee. I hope my, my pronunciation is <laughs> He then transferred his studies to Northwestern University in 1923 and completed a doctorate in medicine degree in 1926. After completing a year internship at the St. Louis Hospital No. 2, at the time and because of racist laws in America, reserved as facility for black graduate medical students only. He then spent 
a year in Europe studying surgery and gynecology and set for the qualifying examination in Scotland so that he could be able to practice in South Africa. So there we go, really, if you think about it. The United States of America does have an umbilical cord linking it with the founders of the ANC, and this dates back to the 19th century. In short, three influential leaders of the ANC were educated here. Actually, it's, it's not three. It's five if we now we discuss issues of gender. If you if we discuss issues of gender. So it should be five five leaders. Why? Charlotte Matek, you know, the first president of the African National Congress Women's League was also educated here in the US. Born in 1847 in the Cape province. She, tower, she towered England, Canada, and the United States with an African choir in the 1890s and remained behind in the United States to study at Wilberforce University in Ohio, where she graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in 1905. She returned to South Africa for completing her studies and played a crucial role in organizing women, women and hence the formation of the ANC Women's League. In 1928, Matayake attended a conference here, which was organized by the African Methodist Episcopal Church and remained active in the church and women's activities until her death in the 1930s. That is actually 1919. Medi Hall, an African-American by birth, and also the wife to Dr. Kuma, headed the African National Congress Women's League from 1943 until 1948. That is why I'm saying we have five leaders, because the two women also are influenced by the fact that they were educated here. And Medi Hall is an, is a, is an American citizen, but she headed the, the ANC Women's League from 1943 to 1948. She was born Mady B. Hall at Winston Salem, North Carolina, and met Kuma, then a widower, on his visit to the United States during 1937-38. She was, she was at that time completing a master's degree in education at Columbia University and she subsequently studied social work at Atlanta University. In 1914, she married Kuma and relocated to South Africa, where she was active in women's organization and also became a fundraiser. She returned to the United States following Kuma's death in 1962. To surmise, you cannot write the early history of the ANC without elaborating the historical fact about its leaders' worldview and, and political philosophies being impacted, being impacted upon by their experiences in the United States of America. And really, this dates back to the 19th century. So for all of you who were really wondering why, why, why the ANC, it's because of the influence of the of the of the of the United States of America uh, on their leaders, that is why I'm saying you know you should read those works you know by Manning and Hunt, where who discuss these issues you know and 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 for me the connection is there, but now on the hate side of their relationship, <laughs> just all lovey dovey you now. <laughs> Now we move to the hate side of the of the of their relationship. Enter the politics of the Cold War. Enter the politics of the Cold War. And and now things turn. Because during the Cold War, the liberation movements became aware of the fact that they have to side themselves with one of the sides, you know, 
in terms of the superpowers. So the ANC decided to take side of the USSIR. So it sided with the Soviets. For me, uh, as Americans, think about it. During your civil war, one of your sides, even though they were for liberty and freedom, they decided to, in terms of the politics of, 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 of the world, in terms of the superpowers there, they decided to seek help from the French, even though we know the French were anti, <laughs> I mean, they were a monarchy then, there were so many problems, it was prior to the French Revolution because they were, and, the side in the U.S. is fighting for freedom, is fighting against the British monarchy. And you go to another country which already pushes the same ideas that you are fighting against. So it became the case during the, Soviet, during, during, during the Cold War. It's just that the ANC decided to choose the Soviet Union, precisely because in South Africa, there was also the influence of, of the South African Communist Party. But then, if you think about it, communism, they didn't side with the, with the, commun with the communists because they really were held under spell by, 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 by white men, and therefore they cannot think about them, or they cannot think about, about, about issues. If you really consider, you know, pre-colonial history, you think about, you know, issues of communalism, you know, communalism, which 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 was really the 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 the, 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 the philosophical worldview still is a philosophical worldview of Africans in the continent. To some extent, you know, socialism come closer to that. So for them, you know communism made sense because it's part of their worldview if you think about uh, basic tenets of of communalism and governance in pre-colonial times you know so that's why in Isizulu we say in Kosi, in Kosi Ngabantu, a king a monarch rules on behalf of the of the people so he doesn't own the land he owns it on behalf of the people and this issue is also very important because it's, it's still define the, the land issues in South Africa because as African land has both economic and spiritual implications. Whilst from for our white, white counterpart, it has economic uh, implications. So in a sense, as part of our broader worldview. So what happened? Um, the United States government then decided to proclaim the ANC as a terrorist organization. And it simply meant that, in as far as they were concerned, its leaders, that is uh, Oliver Tambo, who was the president in exile, who uh, acting on behind of uh, Chief Lutulu, was also designated as a terrorist, as a persona non grata in the US. Simply meant that Nelson Mandela was also regarded as a terrorist by the US government. Therefore, he was a persona non grata in the US. And therefore, it was the case up until 2008, when Mandela came here in 1990 after his release in 1992, he had to get special clearance from the US government. And Condoleezza Rice decided to be famous when she left government in 2008 because they had to endure the granting Mandela special clearance. Then she decided that the last act, while she fell from grace because the party was beaten, then she just do away with that the secretary of, as a secretary of state. So why was Mandela classified as a terrorist by the US government? As I said, it's all about international politics, Cold War politics. If you remember, Nelson Mandela is the founder member of Mkonto West Suizwe, the military wing of the ANC. And he's also its first commander. So he's also his first commander 
And during the 1960s, he left South Africa clandestinely only to pitch up in North Africa. Where does he receive his military training? In Algeria. What is Algeria doing? Algeria is involved in a revolution with France, one of the world superpowers. So if you are the US, anybody who really sides with the revolutionaries in Algeria is, is another terrorist. You know, so he also received military training in Morocco. He also received military training in Ethiopia. I mean, all of you have read his book, you know, Long Walk to Freedom. He does talk about, about this, but he doesn't necessarily have to contextualize all these issues as I'm doing now because he's not deliver, delivering this lecture. So for me, I'm just explaining to you that this is what happened. But what is interesting with the Americans, that was the act of the government, but the American people saw things differently. They saw things differently because what they did was to support the liberation struggle in South Africa through the anti-apartheid movement. And it was churches, it was, it, was, it, was, it was academics, it was students who were part of the anti-apartheid movement here in America. So you, you, you got that contradiction between the government and its people. But some of you are here, really. One would like to thank you for the role that you, you played in that, in, that, in that regard. So Mandela is conscious of those issues when he visits uh, America in, after his release. This is what he said. I've, you know, this is what he said in terms of the harmonious, fraternal relationship with a range of anti-apartheid movement and civil so society NGOs in the US. I found this record in the ANC archive, so I'll quote him, I'll cite him what he said when he was here. And also in terms of the historical context, it's, 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 it's easier for the American people to do this because of the civil rights movement, because of the parallels you know, between the struggle in South Africa with the civil rights movement here in the US. As I said, there's so many publications outside there which, which define this. So Mandela said this, on his visit, a uh, quote, open quote, I was tremendously impressed by the warmth exhibited by the American people towards the African National Congress. I thought that people like Oliver Tambo and others had done remarkable work in bringing the ANC to the notice of the American people. Because of the work that had been done by the ANC working together with the anti-apartheid movement in America, people were so aware of who I was, although it interfered with my official schedule in the US, I liked that. You see, because it was an expression of warmth, kindness, and love expressed by the American people. And then the speech by Clinton covered everything. It was global and very brief. Bill Clinton said what was necessary. I admired that. Close the quote. You know, close the quote. So in a sense, that's what I'm saying, that he also notices that regardless of what the government thinks about him as a terrorist, he acknowledges the support of the American people themselves. He knows exactly that Bill Clinton had to sign a special form to allow him to enter, but he's not vindictive. He's, 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 he embraces Bill Clinton, and he doesn't see the difference between the government and the people of America who supported him. He expressed these positive views about the American people and leaders such as Bill Clinton, despite the fact that he re officially remained you know, on the list. So 
what I'm, I'm going to say, also I'm going to quote another incident. The perestroika and the fall of communism in East Europe changed the relationship between the ANC and the American government. In that, in 1987, for the first time ever, January 1987, the first meeting between the two sides took place. Oliver Tambo, as the president of the ANC, met George Shrews. I hope I'm, trust, I'm, 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 I'm pronouncing that, that. Who was then the Secretary of State. So that was the first ever official meeting between the two. And it was easier then because communism was on the wane. And it was possible then that the was going to be substantial negotiations in South Africa. And, and the Americans saw that it's possible for them to influence what was taking place. But it's surprising that even if when the ANC came here, led by Tambo and the then future president, uh, Tabo Mbeku, who was the right-hand person of Tambo, was part of the delegation, there were still differences within the American uh, people. There were those who were pro the visit, there were those who were against. And there are archival documents of the ANC which really define these differences, what happened when there were people who staged demonstrations outside the doors of this meeting. So what I will do now, I'll move, I'll fast track and, and, and discuss the issue why uh, Nelson Mandela became the public face of the African National Congress. And if you think about it, it should have been the president, that is Oliver Tambo. But Oliver Tambo saw it fit to say, no, I'm not going to be the face of the organization. Even if I am the president, Mandela should be the face of the organization. And if you think about leadership issues in Africa, and the role of the autocratic big men, you know, in Africa. When you are in power, I'm in power. You can't tell me. So, so, so the theory should be, should go like, Tambo should have been the public face because he's the president. But he decided not to be, and he was not autocratic really. And 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 he flies again the theory in terms of uh, governance and leadership issues in Africa. And I think uh, some of the problems we face in the continent is because of such uh, matters and issues that are challenging us, that people tend to personify, you know, uh, governance. And if they're in, they're in. And they'll go on forever and ever and ever. So it will be difficult to take them. So what happened then? Then one, I like to theorize, you know, and say the relationship between the collective and the individual as functionaries of political parties is difficult to rationalize conceptually and theoretically. In as far as the ANC was concerned, the liberation movement always spoke of a collective leadership that took collective decisions which were formulated at its national conferences or conventions. Before such decisions were adopted, the NC had to approach the local and regional branch meetings, precisely because the movement also wanted to have collective decision making at the lower level. Such decision will then be filtered back to the national conference. Therefore, it was important to reach a consensus concerning all decisions that were officially adopted by the organization. However, a collective is a collection of individuals, and there are times in the life of a political movement where individual leaders embody some of the outstanding qualities one would expect from an astute leader. According to the Mandela, the NC had, extreme, uh, had been extremely fortunate in that it had leaders like Tambo, who was not you know, jealous. 
So he goes on and he explains, you know, oh, this is what happened within the movement. We are fortunate, you know, the leader is not autocratic, or he's not an autocrat, so he accepts everybody's view. So he also listens to me. So that's what happened when the organization now decided that in 19, during the 1980s, they are going to set up the release Mandela campaign. And some of you really were participant in that, in that campaign. So I'm trying to find a reason how did it come about? Why did it happen? So this is my, 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 my analysis. And I think the Americans are, what happens in, in America is, is very crucial, is very important in this regard. And then I'll explain to you why. The challenge for the ANC was to identify an engaging individual figure and appealing public face to promote this new strategy. The answer may be found really in the rising influence of television as a tool of mass communication and its massive impact on the politics of the United States during the 1960s. Okay. This is for me the solution, this is the answer. In fact, in fact, one has to take into cognizance that television became a central part of American life in the 1950s. Moreover, impressive technological advances made television sets less expensive and accessible to consumers throughout the United States of America. Therefore, by the 1960s, the majority of the households in America had a television set. Thus, the television became part of everyday life in America. As sales boomed, there were new opportunities for broadcasters and political parties. This was because politics really became more personalized. And the US elections of 1960 are a case in point. Elections between, uh, the, 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 the competition between Richard Nixon and John Kennedy, you know, became uh, definitive. Because really, if you, if you think about it, it became easier, easier for television to project, to focus on the individual than to focus on the entire executive, national executive committee of a Democratic Party or the Republican Party. It's the first time ever in the world that you know this takes place. So television now, in terms of the elections in 1960, focus on John Kennedy and and and, and Richard Nixon. Therefore, the 1960 election was the closest in history, despite Kennedy's stirring rhetoric and apparent triumph in televised political debates. I mean, in their book entitled politics tele and television. Gladys and Kurt Lang writes that in 1960, Richard M. Nixon, I quote, and John F. Kennedy were the first presidential candidates to appear together before television cameras. Four times altogether, four, hour, four hours within a span of four weeks, for weeks, they answered questions put to them by a panel of four newsmen. In their first encounter on September 26, 1960, in Chicago, and on October 27 in Washington, D.C., and October 21 in New York, the two men spoke from the same studio. On October 13, when Nixon was in Los Angeles and Kennedy was in New York, they met each other at a distance through a split screen technique. Judged by the audience they reached, the broadcast was a huge su success. Between 65 and 70 million watched any one of the telecasts. Somewhere between 85 and 120 million were estimated to have witnessed at least one of the debates. So indeed, from the 1960s onwards, this became the standard in Europe and all over 
the world. And the ANC soon realized that really we need to do the same. We have to identify an individual that is going to help our cause. But it was not an easy decision. There were fights within the ANC because it was premised on the Congress Alliance where you had the South African Indian Congress, Colored People's Congress, and the white-led Congress of Democracy, forming, including the trade union, the South African uh, Congress of Trade Union, SACTU, forming a Congress alliance that was led by the ANC. Before, you had to project all of them. Actually, that's what happened in 1955 when the Freedom Charter was drawn. But suddenly, you simply say, no, it's no longer the case, you know. It's like we have to find, you know, a person who can simply project, who can simply become the public face because of these technological developments. And this is the case throughout the world. In Britain, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party soon join suit because of the impact of television here in the US and elsewhere in Europe, it becomes the case. So the ANC therefore decides then to discuss this issue. So my argument is that really, therefore it became obvious to everyone that the advent of the multimedia, particular television as mass, communi as a mass communication tool was merely not a passing fad. The ANC leadership met to discuss the way forward, but there were questions to be answered you know, about this. Firstly, was it correct to identify one individual to promote the struggle for national liberation in South Africa? If the answer was yes, would not the NC and allies create a situation where the cult of the personality will be the order of the day? As it happened in the Soviet Union with Joseph Stalin, in Cuba with Fidel Castro, in China with Chairman Mayo Zedong. So they had to think about these issues because it was the reality that was, that was facing them. Therefore, because one, if one wanted to be successful in terms of international solidarity, they had to choose one person. But they decided to be clever. Their campaign was um, free Nelson Mandela and all other political prisoners. So, so they did expantiate that issue. So these are the reasons why they focused on, on Mandela. Uh, first, Mandela was, ideal, was an ideal choice because he was the first leader of Umkonto Wesizo, the military wing of the NCN. He also had spearheaded the All in Africa Conference held in South Africa in the 1960s. By the 1960s already, you know, he had shown signs of remarkable leadership potential within the organization, particularly after the Sharpeville massacre of 1906. Those, those who knew him and had worked with him in South Africa argued that he possessed charismatic uh, qualities, qualities that were essential for one to become the public face of an organization. He was magnetic in terms of personality, so that whenever he entered a hall and when there was a meeting, everybody soon realized that he, he, he was a Ryan. Secondly, he had a larger than life sort of personality. I remember when I said, you no, know, became what they called uh, the Black Pimpernel because of his escapades and ending up in North Africa and undergoing military training. So within the uh, the, 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 the country, you know, people sort of held him in awe oh, because it was a difficult thing to do because of the state security system, but he ends up eluding them. That's why there's still a controversy in terms of how he was, he was arrested, you know. Some, you know, in terms of conspiracy theories think uh, the CIA might have been involved, you know. That's, that's another issue to be discussed another day. So that's what I'm saying, that at the same time, despite what the regime did to destroy him, his performance during the Rivonia trial also caught the imagination of the entire country because he was bold, he was upfront, he didn't chicken out, 
you could stand up for his rights and say it in court. So in a sense, therefore, we also think about the factional politics within the ANC. They were there. They were not perfect. But at the end of the day, you know, Oliver Tambo says, I think that Mandela should be the person in charge. Because at Robben Island, there were divisions. There was uh, the former president's father, that is Govan Beke, and Harry Kuala on one side, and Mandela was also on the other side. So they had endless disputes, endless disputes. And one of the disputes was that the South African government was trying to use Mandela's relationship with uh, Chief Keiza Matazima of the Transkai because they were, they were relatives. So they tried to use him to ask Mandela to denounce the liberation struggle in South Africa so that she will be released from, from, from Robben Island. But he refused. He took a stand that I'm not going to do that, and then I'm not going to sell out. So those are all the issues that I think he was chosen. So because there's so much for me to discuss in terms of, of, that, of, of this analysis, I'll, I'll, I'll just fast track and just uh, contextualize um, Mandela's um, sort of um, comparative uh, role with other prisoners in Latin America. So my argument is that we should guide against really concluding that the NC was unique and exceptional in using the tactical strategy of harmonizing the individual and the collective imperative in a given struggle for political emancipation. For example, in the case of the politically oppressed in Latin America, particular Chile, the world communist movement adopted a similar political strategy that was adopted by the NC and made an international call for the release of Louis Covellan. You know, if you, some of you know about him, the longtime leader of the Chilean Communist Party, whose support was critical to the rise in 1970 of Salvador Allende, the first elected Marxist head of state in Latin America. So Covalan will be remembered in the West as a high-profile political prisoner in General Auguste Pinochet regime of terror. He was subsequently exchanged for the Soviet, Soviet Union dissident Vladimir Pukovsky in 1976. Although there were many other Chilean political prisoners incarcerated in jail, the Soviet Union and others launched a concerted, cam a concerted campaign of for Kovalin release. The call for Kovalin freedom became a symbol of Chilean, Chilean resistance. He traveled to the Soviet Union, the, term, the German Democrat, Dem Democratic Republic, and other socialist countries. When he was finally set free to thank those who had supported him staunchly, Kovalin also attended international conferences where he was upfront and called for the release of Nelson Mandela and other political prisoners. Another interesting case study is that of Ananias Maidana, the former general secretary of the Communist Party of Paraguay. He served more than 20 years as a political prisoner under the violent dictatorship of Alfredo Stroessner. The Paraguayan regime was, so, was exceptionally repressive, repressive at the time, but the international solidarity movement was unable to build an effective campaign for his release. Yet, Maidana's case was just as deserving as those of Kovalan and Mandela. He served a long term of imprisonment as just as Mandela, and what he did was just as courageous. The courage, the, the, for me, the crucial difference here was that the NC as a liberation movement was able to mobilize its struggle around Mandela in a manner that no political organization in the world has ever done before. But now, because of the time, <laughs> I'd just like to conclude that, you know, there's much that I've written, but I'm checking the time. Really, the support, the release Mandela campaign was was also possible because of 
of these following reasons. You know, because remember the campaign is released Nelson Mandela and other political prisoners. And you find that the common people in the United States are also the ones who are pushing that. They are marching against their government, you know, carrying banners, placards, and posters, marching through the states, the different states in America, saying exactly that. So for me, I would like to cite uh, Isep Pahat, who writes in the preface of our third volume uh, about the same issue, that really true international solidarity, the global anti-apartheid movement developed from the late 1950s and early 1960s onward was a social movement of a very special kind. It stood simultaneously in opposition to apartheid and in solidarity with the oppressed people of South Africa. It drew, it drew on the historical tradition of opposition to slavery, colonialism, and imperialism. It also drew heavily on the civil rights movement in the United States, also the movement for women's rights, the anti-nuclear weapons movement, and other anti-war movement. And it grew into the most successful global solidarity movement in human history. It demonstrated that collective action in solidarity with the victims of injustice can be a very powerful force for social change on a global stage. As a transnational movement, it operated on the moral high ground of a commitment to equality and human rights and a fundamental opposition to racism and racial discrimination. As awareness of the atrocities of the apartheid system grew, so, the, so did the global opposition to the apartheid region developed in strength and in numbers. And some of you were part of this movement. So I, tell, I just decide to end there because of the time factor. If there are questions, you are welcome. Then. Okay, and I think on behalf of all of us, I'd like to say siabonga. Thank you very much. We do have time for questions. What we would ask that you do is come to this microphone here, and uh, you can ask your question there, and then um, Dr. Nglovu will answer your question here, and then we'll wrap things up um, about, at the latest, 25 after. So there, there is some time. You're welcome to come down. Professor, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by this, you know, the notion of the cult of personality that you've introduced here uh, surrounding Mandela and this very, as, as a very deliberate strategy on the part of the ANC. It's something I was not, I was not familiar with. Um, do you, f uh, what comparisons can you draw between um, some of the other kind of cults of personality occurring in other uh, sub-Saharan uh, African countries um, that have not worked out so positively. I'm thinking of uh, the U.S. support of um, some of the other uh, autocrats in uh, Africa uh, where, you know, the, the personalities that the U.S. Th thought were going to be great allies and didn't turn out to be great allies and um, was that was that a risk on the part of the ANC? Um, was was there 
any kind of comparative notion of these? I mean, you drew comparisons with some of these, the Latin American context, but what kinds of comparisons can you draw with the other African countries? Thank you. Yeah, it, that's, 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 a, that's a question that I, that I that just infer that, that, that there's this problem in the continent because of, of, of leaders who are inward looking and will become autocrats. I think the, the NC did well, you know, to really take this issue seriously, you know, and broaden its, higher, its horizon in as far as uh, not, in, not, not looking inwards to itself and, and, and realized that, you know, uh, the issues at stake here are about social justice, equality, and, 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 and the very same issues, if they go about it, and, and also freedom, are the very same issues that will be trumpeted by the United States government in terms of the civil rights movements here. So for them, they made it a point that uh, they analyze the situation on the ground. And then, and then they decide not to generalize that uh, in terms of that not all African, not all, not all American people support the position of its government in terms of supporting the dictatorships in Africa as a continent, because that is against the democratic principles of the constitution here in South Africa. So in terms of them seeing the global picture, they then decide that you know, we, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll take the argument back to the American people. It's their choice for them if they support, if they support the apartheid regime, you know, because South Africa is part of the African continent. The very same dictators that you're talking about, like Mobutu, uh, are also in South Africa in the form of Vervut and Forster. So the ANC then decides that, therefore, the question is for the American people to answer whether are they for democracy or are they not for democracy, because the very same American people are also doubling, are trying to deal with the conundrum that has to do with um, and the civil rights movement. Yeah. So, 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 so then for the ANC, we are part of the a human race through international solidarity. You can provide solution to this problem in South Africa. And most of you choose to be on the part of, of democracy as against the autocratic leaders of the African continent, including Mobutu and Foster in South Africa and the white minority regime in South Africa. So it's really th about thinking about, about the issues further and, and, and also posing the question to you, which side are you on? Because, because these, these, we're part of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the international community. Remember, South Africa is important here in terms of its geostrategic position and the wealth and the mineral resources that it holds. So for, it, for, for the ANC to take side with, with the Soviet Union, therefore it means that the most powerful country in the, in the, in the, in the continent will be in the hands of, 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 of the communist. So at the same time then, when the Americans, you know, try the, its best to say we're going to safeguard this, therefore we're going to support the white minority regime as autocrats. So that's, that's really a challenge for the ANC. That is why then when they look at international trends, they realize that, you know, we need a face behind the struggle to, so that to make sense to the American people. So they're using, they're using v various weapons of the struggle. Like last night, I mean, you were watching the film, the film Amandla. It's not only about politics, they're also using culture. And if you remember what they did also, the famous Free Mandela concert in, 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 in the UK, 
you know, in, in Hyde Park, I think, you know, where American musicians participate in Tracy Tra Chapman, Stevie Wonder, the young Whitney Houston then was part of this of that of that concert. So 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 the, the churches, you know, the, the students as I said. So so for them it's it's not they are not inward looking. It's about everybody taking a stance. The reason why Mandela came to visit here in the nineteen nineties after his release was simply to come here and say thank you. You know, thank you, you know, for the role that you played. And for you guys to play that role uh, you you had to grapple with that issue, with that question that you raised, you know, and you had to take a side and you took a side. So for me, I think the, the solution is for them to be politically astute and understand the complexities of international politics and, 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 and history. And I'm trying to say for the future generation, for the students here, in terms of what is happening in the world, you know, it was done before through the worldwide anti-apartheid movement to stand up against atrocities you know, created you know, by humans against humanity. So you can go back and revive that movement and take a stand against what is happening throughout the world now. Even the campaign here in the US, you know, the the world against the Wall Street, and it falls within it falls within the ambit, you know, of the worldwide anti-apartheid, you know, committee. It's just that after South Africa liberation came, then it died a natural death. So I think it needs to be revived, and 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 the best practices in terms of what they did can be revoked, and 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 then the struggle continues. That's all I can say. Okay, if you have a question, please, please come down to the mic. And if you um, want to, you can sit down here. If there's someone ahead of you, would you like to accommodate all the questions? And maybe it would be good to take a couple of questions at a time. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, and, and we'll do that. I, I'm going to abuse my privileges at the microphone here. I, I failed to, I wanted to let you know what is on the back of Dr. Nvovo's shirt here, um, which I think is pretty significant. Um, so maybe he could, it's the, the very end of Mandela's statement in court. Um, here they were being tried for treason, which would have been the death sentence. And at the very end, he wrote out his sentence to say, the, the ideal of a democratic, free and democratic South Africa was an ideal that he was prepared um, to die for. And the lawyer said, take that statement out because you're going to be asking for the death sentence. And he kept it in. So that, that's what is on the back of his shirt there. Okay, we'll um, take a, how about we do these three questions and then answer and we'll see where we're at. Okay. Um, so as you look at the history of the, of the continent of Africa as a whole, um, there's before colonialism more of a, a tribal rule and governance, and then there's an imposition uh, with colonialism and countries are drawn and governance structures are put into place. I wanted to ask what uh, are the merits that you've seen and the benefits that you've seen from that, the, the harm that you've seen from that, and in your view, what is the, um, what is the best in state for the continent of Africa in terms of governance? Firstly, I just want to say that I'm a high school student from California, so I feel privileged to be here right now. And um, my question is, you were talking about the relationship between the ANC and the US government. And I was wondering what, in 1994, when the, the US decided to be bystanders in the genocide of Rwanda, what that did between the relationship? I'm excited to see you because my father is from South Africa and I was born there and so we have a connection, my family, with South Africa and um, I'm curious what kind of political change you see coming for South Africa because talking to my cousins and my Oma and all of them, they there's a lot of concern specifically now with 
the ANC and the direction it might be taking and the support that the ANC is or is not receiving from the greater part of the, of the South African citizens. And I just want, I want to hear your personal take on that and how, where do you see South Africa? Thank you. I'll begin with the last question. It's the easiest of them all, precisely because you cannot undo what took place for 360 years in 80 years, in 18 years, in 18 years, and no one in the world has has has, has, has the, the secret key. Because if they had that template, we would have bought it in 1994 and implemented it. So for me, it simply means that. It's time to, for white South Africans to realize that they also have to roll up their sleeves and, and, and come up with, 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 with solutions in terms of what is facing us, precisely because we avoided the civil war option. You know, we avoided the civil war option. Because they look, they seem disinterested, we might go back there. They have been given chances before through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. They said to us, go to hell, stuff your commission. It ended, it ended up being us, the oppressed, being the ones who used that commission in terms of nation building. And what did white South Africans do? We dismissive. So you have to understand then that when the African majority said, we gave you a chance and you didn't want to come up to the party, we can't be forgiving until time immemorial, until eternity. There's a time where we say enough is enough, also on our side. So the challenge is for white South Africans to define themselves as South African, what it means to be South African, what it means to be an African. No, so, so we are all in this together. So there is democracy in South Africa. You cannot blame the ANC for playing the game correctly in terms of politics. If the government elected by the majority of the people, we have to respect that. In terms of internal dynamics uh, within the party, that's their problem. The best thing to do the constitution allows you to vote them to vote them out of power and say go to hell. You know, the better party must come in and take up. So, for me, that's the other solution. In terms of the constitution, it's doable. So, we can't blame them for being able to be efficient in terms of winning the, the political power, but we do have problems particularly when it comes to what I regard as the second revolution, that is the economic revolution. So the best for me, the best for me, the best solution that I see is plausible. It's sort of a public, private, sort of joining together of hands in terms of addressing you know, the challenges that are facing us, not for private government, private, enterprises and private business be saying that it's not our own, we're not involved in politics for the government. They just have to join hands with government, you know. And and and, and it happened here when it was suddenly said we cannot allow the big corporations to fail, we're going to fund them. And the public private enterprise was well mm, came into effect, even if you don't want to talk about it as that, you know. So it happens, join forces, face the challenges. Uh, white South Africans who still are the richest in the world. I mean, after Brazil, differences in terms of inequalities in South Africa and Brazil, they have to realize that it's time for them to join hands with the government and try and come up with a solution to this problem that your parents and your grandmother uh, are experiencing because they are South Africans after all, and it's up to them anyway to define themselves as, as Africans. And the next question that I'm going to 
uh, address is the first question itself that um, I think some of the problems that uh, are bedeviling us, I know, them, in terms of uh, governance, is the claim by our colonizers that before they came into our world, we didn't know anything about democracy. That's false. That's really false. You know, and they are going to introduce the concept of democracy and human rights and 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 and, and, and how to govern to us. And, and 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 the best way they went about it is they through divide and rule divided us into the so called tribes who don't see eye to eye. You know, who are always constantly fighting on military expedition. You know, so the concept of 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 of, of tribes, it's very ideological. You, know, you don't hear Europeans speaking about Germanic tribes and Germans as 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 as, as tribals. It's only Africans who have to have tribes. You know, whilst we know that even. Europe between the Scottish and the English, we can say the English tribes and the Scottish tribes, you know, the fighting for independence and vote is coming in 2014 with the Scottish tribes, <laughs> you know, wanting to secede from, from England. It's, they are not tribal, they understand democracy, how it works. It's only Africans who are, you know. no, what happened was that, uh, it's another question. It can be another. It can be another talk in terms of such talks. You know, what happened during pre-colonial times? The forms of governments then, and 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 for them, it was more about reaching a consensus in terms of of of, of challenges. That is why I said then, they made it a point that which is still a, a an issue today in that, you know. For example, as I mentioned, in terms of the land, the land is known is not owned by an individual. Before the white man comes to Africa, the land is not owned by an individual with a title deed. The land is owned by the community, by the society. The king or the queen is ruling on behalf of the people. He cannot sell the land doesn't belong to him. To some extent, that's why then the argument goes that in terms of class, then we have a problem because in terms of uh, social stratification, if you are a king, you belong to the upper class. If you are a commoner, you, be, you belong to the lower class. But now in terms of our uh, the way, our way of life, cosmology, the way we look at things, this person who's supposed to be at the top is supposed to be individual. He's supposed to own the land, but he doesn't own it. The commoner is also a stakeholder. He owns this land. This person cannot sell it on his behalf because if he wants to, there is what we call the governance system, the Senate or parliamentary system. is called or Mkandli or Ipunga where these issues are discussed. You know, there's so many issues are discussed. There, there are issues like in terms of uh, public health and the old women who, save as, who serve as gynecologists, that you have to tell the men that when a child is born, you're not supposed to have access to the child. The women are in control. So the issue that uh, African women are oppressed and perpetuated, no, no. Issues of childcare and, and what goes on in terms of family issues. Child, the woman is in charge. When you are men, you have to abstain. You have to be from far away because there are issues about germs and diseases and, and the child is not yet immune to those things. So women are in control. They say, go away. When the white person comes in, what does it do? He changes the system. 
the land belongs to an individual. The land, now you need a title deed. You have to sign. And then sometimes they sign in on behalf of the people because they are non-literate in terms of writing. Um, a colonial can simply put an X and claim that this is his signature. And therefore, the anti-colonial struggle is about the land issues. So I think for me, therefore, they should have taken into cognizance the fact that you know, land is not owned by individuals, land cannot be sold by individuals, and they have to decide that, you know, what we find here is, is a system that you can use. But what does it mean? That's socialism. <laughs> so it's bad. So what do we do? We destroy the native, we destroy the indigenous people. So for me, that's, that, has been, that has been the problem so in terms of answering your question. We should have adopted the best systems from the past, but because they clash with your ideologies and your worldview, then you become supreme. You win. Why do you win? Technology favors you in terms of the gun. You know, it's because you have the gun in terms of technological development, then you end up being supreme and you instill your rule and law. Uh, the second question was, what was the second question about? Can you remind me? Oh, Rwanda. Yeah. yeah, what I can say about the second question is the fact that um, you, can't, you can't blame the United States of America. You have to blame Africans themselves, yeah. even though they were a superpower. You, know, you have to blame the organization of African Union. If it was strong, the United States would have taken instruction from them. And France also here as a former colonial power. Rather than blame the United States, you should focus uh, blame to France. You know, what did they do? Because they are all together in the UN Security Council, probably France should have been the one who had to stand up for, for what happened. And, and also, you know, even before you answer the question on Rwanda, you still have to answer the question on Namibia because the because, 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 because it happened in Namibia when it was still a German colony, and most of you don't know about that. You know, and Germany was, 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 was left off the hook. By the time the Holocaust took place, the Germans had done it in Africa. So if there were checks and balances after or what happened in Namibia, Maybe the Germans might have been controlled, you know, in terms of the Holocaust. So for me, therefore, in terms of Holocaust studies, then you go back there, the first time ever where it took place before the First World War, and find answers why or not the German stopped. And surely, in this sense, you cannot blame the United States of America because they don't have answers for everything that happens in the world. And as I said, Africans are also responsible in terms of explaining, in particular, the organization of African Union, which is the African, which is the AU now, the African Union. So those are complicated issues. It's not only around it goes back. Even the South Africans themselves are killable in the sense that, I mean, not that is our former colonial partners, the British because the first concentration camps are created in South Africa during the South African War, the so-called Anglo-Boer War, and the Germans simply adopt those, you know, because of, it was the strategy used by the English. So the French, the English, the Germans are also part of the problems. So it's not the US alone that has to be the world's policeman and and be blamed for things that we are also responsible for as, as Africans. That's all I can say. Okay. Well, I think we're out of time. Thank you for coming. We'll give Dr. Ndolvo another round of applause. And thank him so much for being here.